his will. That here is Christ who has saved you. And that Christ did the will of God all the time, every time, always, ever, only the will of God. And he did that will of God conscientiously. He did that will of God from all his heart. And the moment you are born again, you are coming to the kingdom, the Lord is challenging you. You are saved to be like Christ, your Savior. You are saved so you can be conformed unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he did the will of God, so you will do the will of God in Jesus' name. Did I hear any amen there? Psalm 143. Psalm 143. This should be your prayer. This should be your desire. And when you pray this kind of prayer, you pray it with all your heart. You pray it sincerely. You pray it because you want an answer. And you pray because you are going to actually do it. We're looking at Psalm 143. And we're looking at verse 10. Psalm 143. And we're looking at verse 10. It says, teach me to do thy will. Teach me to do thy will. It's not just that I want to know it, I want to have it in my mind, have it in my head, learn it, and be able to quote the verses. Yes, that's important. You must know it. But then you must do it. You must fulfill it. It says, teach me to do thy will. Then it says, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me unto the land of uprightness. He wants us to know the will of God and to do the will of God. When he saves us, he gives us the strength. And now when he sanctifies us, he also makes us to do that will of God in such a complete manner. Philippians chapter 2. Reading from verse 13. Philippians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, for it is God which walketh in you. It is God, your creator. It is God, your redeemer. It is God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is God who loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son. That as you believe in him, you will not perish but have everlasting life. And he says, it is that God which walketh in you. Not just uh, you know talking to you, he performs the miracle within you, the miracle of conversion, and the miracle of consecration, and the miracle of total surrender unto the Lord. And it says, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, you will do it, you'll perform it, and the will of God will be number one, the priority of your life in Jesus' name. Hebrews. Chapter 13, reading from verse 20, Hebrews. Chapter 13, reading from verse 20. It says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead, and Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Tell me what follows in verse 21. Make you perfect, he will do it. Every imperfection, the Lord will take away. If we really want to serve the Lord, if we really want to follow the Lord, if we want not just to be nominal Christians, nominal churchgoers, if we want not just to be head knowledge Christians, but we want to have the real nature of Christ within us, that's exactly what God will do. Make you perfect in every good work, look at this, to do his will. And he's talking about sanctification here. When he says he'll make you perfect sanctification to do his will, walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You know, the Adamic nature, the old man hesitates. When the old man hears the word of God, when someone who still carries and is having within him, is having the old man, the Adamic nature, when that pe fellow hears about the will of God, he hesitates. The old man, the Adamic nature, staggers at the commandment of God, 
at the requirement to do the will of God. The old man vacillates. I want to, shouldn't I? I will. Can I start now? Maybe I will do it sometimes, but not now. He vacillates because he has the old man. The old man wavers and struggles. He struggles with the will of God. The old man. He cannot go forth immediately when God has declared this is the will of God and this is what he requires. The old man will delay and hold back. If you find yourself hesitating, staggering at the will of God, you find yourself vacillating, you find yourself wavering and struggling, you find yourself delaying and holding back, that's the old man. That's the old man there. The old man calculates and bargains. When he hears about the will of God, this is the will of God. We're not just talking about the will of God in marriage. The will of God in every area of your life. In your sanctification, because that's the will of God. In your upright life, that's the will of God. In being separated from the world, that's the will of God. In carrying out what he has called you to do, going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that's the will of God in preparing for heaven. That's the will of God in being conformed unto Christ. That's the will of God. When the old man hears about the will of God, he calculates and he bargains. If I were to do that, what do I get? If I am to do that, what do I gain? If I go into that, what advantage will it be for me? That's the old man. The old man reasons and uh, weighs the options. The old man is, uh, you know, reasoning and weighing the option. If I do this, somebody else will do that. If I do this, somebody else will do that. That's the old man. When you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, I want this old man not only crucified, but destroyed, taken out of the way, then sanctification frees you from the old man. I say sanctification frees you from the old man. It frees you from the downward pull of the Adamic nature. That old man, when he's gotten rid of, the sanctification unites you with Christ. As he wanted to do the will of God, so also you want to do the will of God. It is that sanctification that brings you into cheerful agreement with God. God says this, yes, Lord, I agree. I don't know where it will carry me. I don't know what will be the final consequence, but Lord, I agree because the old man is gone. It is the sanctification that makes you to accept the will of God, desire the will of God, do the will of God, perform the will of God, fulfill the will of God. Our will is swallowed up in his will. His word, his way, his will to be done in our lives at any cost, whatever the cost may be. The Lord will do it. Colossians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 12. Colossians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 12. It tells us what the prayer of the ministers of God should be for the members of the congregation. And if their prayer is like that, they themselves must have the evidence and the experience of wanting to do, desiring to do, delighting to do the will of of God. It tells us in Colossians chapter 4 verse 12, it says Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that she may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That's what he himself, Epaphras, had experienced. And because I explained that, by the touch, by the transformation of the Lord Jesus Christ in his spirit, his soul, and his mind. Now he prayed for the Colossian believers. And as he prayed for the Colossian believers, fervently was praying. 
regularly he was praying and wholeheartedly he was praying devotedly he was praying for the Colossian believers and how we also should be praying for ourselves today this kind of prayer that will be totally yielded and totally committed and totally given and totally absolutely surrendered to the perfect will of God and after you have prayed for yourself and you have seen the evidence in your life then you are praying for members of the church members of your local church members that you are interacting with the members that you know that you, look at that verse 12 again a preference is one of you you are one of the people you're a minister among the people you love the people you cherish the people and you de desire the best for the people is servant of Christ you are servant of Christ and you know that what will please Christ is that the members under your influence the workers under your influence the leaders under your influence they will be like Christ they'll be conformed unto Christ a servant of Christ salutes you always laboring how always laboring I said how fervently you know if you are laboring haphazardly you're laboring you're almost sleeping on the pulpit you're laboring but it's dull your laboring is like there's no interest. Your laboring is like somebody is forcing you to do it. Your laboring and you're saying, when will I be excused from doing this? That's not fervent. But it says, laboring fervently. For you in prayers, in prayers, in preaching, in exhortation, in instruction, in everything that we do, look at what he prayed for, that she may be found, that he may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. The Lord will do it through us. He'll do it through you in Jesus' name. Look at what other people like us, look at what they did and look at how they did it. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, reading from verse 3, it says, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they, you see these people, as they were ministering to the Lord, as they were doing the will of God, it says, they did it to their power. And when it appears that they were totally exhausted, they didn't pack up, and go back home, I cannot do more. That's all I can do. It says here, yeah, beyond their power, it says they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift. And then it goes on to say, and take upon, uh, upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. Look at verse 5. And this they did, and this you will do. Not as we hoped, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They gave themselves wholeheartedly, completely, without any reservation and without any hypocrisy. They gave themselves according to the will of God. I pray that that same mind will be in every one of us. That same heart will be in every one of us. How did it happen to them? They were saved. Their salvation was genuine. That's how they were able to do the will of God wholeheartedly. They were sanctified and the sanctification was genuine, was real, was deep, affected their hearts affected their mind, affected them completely, and so they were able to give themselves totally unto the Lord and to the service of the Lord by the will of God. Point number two now, single-minded conformity to God's prevailing will. Single-minded conformity to God's prevailing will. We're coming to... Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21. Acts, chapter 21. I'm reading here from verse 10. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 21, reading from verse 10. 
And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus says the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him unto the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, but we and they of that place besought him not to go to Jerusalem. When they heard persecution was waiting for him, when they heard opposition was waiting for him, when they heard steep resistance was waiting for him in Jerusalem, then the people of that place and the companions of Paul the Apostle, they pleaded with him. They said, you cannot go. You must not go. Look at verse, 14, verse 13. Then Paul answered, what mean ye? To weep and to break my heart? For I am ready. Somebody there, I am ready. Ready to do the will of God? I am ready. Ready to preach the gospel? I am ready. Ready to endure persecution? Are you ready? Say it out aloud. I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 14. And when he would not be persuaded, because he had made up his mind. You know, if you didn't make up your mind, if you were wavering yourself, and then all the people are saying, don't go, don't go, don't do it, don't fulfill the will of God, you say, well, I want to take to what my people are saying. I want to take to what my friends are saying. I want to take to what the brethren were saying. Because you had not, not made up your mind. You need to really me to do the will of God. Let's say, for example, the will of God is restitution in a particular area of your life. And then your friends urge, and members of the church church, and these people that are not steady, they are not steadfast in the word of God, they come to you and they say, we hear that you want to do this and do that. Yes, we understand restriction, but don't you know this one? This one is delicate. This one is terrible. It's okay because they are spoken to me. I don't think I want to do that again. You need to make up your mind. Let's say, for example, you want to evangelize. Because you have the conviction, they're perishing, and I must go out and reach out to them. And somebody comes to you and he says, don't you do over time your place of work? Do you have, is your salary enough? I'm not going to spend extra time on your work. Okay, I wanted to before, but you know, they are talking to me now. You didn't mean to serve the Lord before, but when you mean to serve the Lord, and say, this is what I am going to do. You do it in Jesus' name. Look at that. Look at verse 14. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, what did they say? We ceased saying, what did they say? The will of the Lord be done. He had made up his mind because he had a single-minded commitment to God's prevailing will. They said, let the will of God prevail. Let the will of God be done. As a true child of God, the will of God must prevail in your life. I said the will of God must prevail in your life. That's our prayer. That's our expectation. That's our hope. That's our love. That's our delight. That's our joy. To see the will of God prevail over man's will in our lives. To see the will of God prevail over Satan's will in our lives. Our desire, our joy, our mind is to see the will of God prevail over 